I am going to be talking today about some collaborative research that we've been doing with the um, Division of Natural Resources, the US Forest Service and BYU here in Provo. This work is so far three years worth of monitoring that we've done in the Tusher Mountains of Utah. And today I'm just gonna present, it's not, the work is not completed, but I'm gonna kind of give you a, a play of what we've know to date. So as most of you know, there's controversy surrounding uh, mountain goats in Southern Utah um, where they're not native. And there have been introductions of mountain goats um, into parts of Southern Utah. The LaSalle's in particular is where there've been lawsuits and things like that. But the Tusher Mountains also um, do, are, do not have mountain goats native to those ranges and mountain goats were introduced into the Tusher Mountains in 1986. So we know that aerial surveys um, showed about 240 mountain goats by 2011. Um, currently, they've reduced the number near objective of about 175 mountain goats. So that's their management objective. And it's currently the population size appears to be about that level. Um, bighorn sheep were thought to have inhabited this mountain, and this was a paper by Dalton and Spillett in 1971, and that was the rationale um, for which the um, Division of Wildlife Resources um, used to introduce mountain goats into this area. So there are, why are we concerned at a rare plant meeting about mountain goats being introduced into the Tusher Mountains? Well, um, there are 27 endemic plant species to the Tusher Mountains in Utah. And I'm saying not to the Tusher Mountains, to the alpine communities above tree line in the Tusher Mountains. So 27 endemics to the alpine communities of the Tusher Mountains. And in Alexander in 2016, gave five of those high priority conservation, um, high priority for conservation based on this introduction of mountain goats. So the first one that was the high priority for um, conservation was Pecara castorius. Um, the second one was Draba ramulosa. The third was Drabosobolifera. The fourth is Ipomopsis spicata subspecies tridactyla. And the fifth was Castilea parvula variety parvula, which is the Tusher Mountain paintbrush. Um, the ones with asterisks are the ones that are also listed as sensitive by the Forest Service and the, and the Forest Service Regional Forester. Now, these species don't occupy the Tusher Mountain areas equally. So where are the Tusher Mountains? For those of you who don't know, they're located between Beaver on the west and Marysville on the right, as you can see here. And the mountain range, um, which I have up here, has several peaks above 12,000 feet in elevation. So this was our study area. There's one other thing I wanna point out. There's a white substrate, hopefully you can see this here, and also a darker substrate, okay? that um, is included in this Tusher Mountain. So Pacara castorius and Draba ramulosa are, on the, are found only on the white substrates, which is called the Belknap volcanic. So two different volcanic eruptions in this area that form the substrates of the Tusher Mountains. The second, um, the, uh, two, the bullion volcanics here, which are the darker, Draba sobolifera and Castilea parvula and variety parvula are endemic to the darker substrates in the Tusher Mountains. Ipomopsis spicata variety tridactyla is restricted to iron rich red soils around Mount Brigham here on the Bullion Volcanics. Um, Ipomopsis tridactyla also grows um, down in the Cedar Breaks area. The other four are endemic only to the Tusher Mountains. Okay, so what, when we got involved, we wanted to um, monitor what ungulates were eating in the Tusher Mountains and if they were eating rare plants. So we made observations of ungulates seen grazing above timberline. We, you know, we initially started to focus on just the mountain goats, but we thought, hey, we probably should include all other ungulates that are involved. One of the things that you should note, though, is this area above tree line in the Tushers is a closed grazing allotment. It is closed to cattle. However, um, over the last three years, we see cattle occasionally moving up into this area. There are also native deer and elk, which um, forage in above tree line. The elk less often than the deer and the mountain goats. So we um, did 
feeding site sampling, which we're going to refer to here a lot as our centroid sampling, because what we did when we saw a feeding site, we waited till the animals left. We kept track of the number of animals feeding. We kept um, track of the gender, if we could tell it, and if they were young or adults. And we went in, we established a sampling strategy in the center of the area where they were foraging and did um, transects 25 meters in four cardinal directions. The first direction of the transect was um, randomly um, generated, was a randomly de generated degree um, transect line. And so from that, we um, assess the vegetation using um, Dobbin Meyer quadrat frames every five meters on each of the transects. And from that, we observed not only what plants were available, but also we observed amount of utilization of plant species. We also set up long-term monitoring plots for all of the five most species of high priority concern. And um, we've set up at least two sites that we monitored for each of the rare plant species. Um, we tagged up to 100 individuals per site. And you can see one of the transects. This is on uh, Mount Belknap Saddle. And two rare plants co-occur at the site. The quadrats um, were used to measure community composition. And you can see here how we set them on along the transect lines. We also measured vegetative and reproductive parameters for each tagged individual. We set up recruitment plots to assess seedling survivorship and new recruits, recruits that were in the sites every year. And we set up um, utilization or natural or anthropogenic disturbances were also, we looked at utilization and if there were any disturbances to these sites. So this is, there was a lot done, okay? And so I'm gonna show you some of the other research that we've done to date. So this is just summary of what we've done to date. We have three years of monitoring of tag um, data for the tagged populations. We have camera trap monitoring that we established in May of this last year and went through September at each of the long-term monitoring sites for the five rare plants. We, um, to date, have 214 feeding sites that we have analyzed um, in 2018, 2019, and 2020. So far, we have 105 mountain goat feeding sites, 73 deer, 30 elk, six cattle, and we also had, for comparative purposes, um, random numbers generator generated random coordinates, um, GPS coordinates in this range, and we also sampled random sites, 38 of them. We um, also collected from the long-term monitoring plots and also from our feeding sites um, DNA, which we used, um, fecal samples, in the, and we used them to generate fecal DNA. And um, we used um, next generation sequencing meta barcoding um, using the turn L markers for plants. Um, Jonah Ventures, again, we've heard of them before this in this meeting, were the ones that helped us with the fecal DNA analysis. So I could go into and spend my entire talk on just one of these rare plants um, with five of them. So I thought I would summarize and I wanna focus on mountain goat and, and focus on utilization. So the first one I'm gonna talk about are the um, two on the Belknap volcanics. The first one is Pecara castoreus. Um, and this are the feeding sites, the number of feeding sites in the year by the ungulate, okay? And the number that contained that rare plant. So the Pecara castoreus was found in seven mountain goat, six mountain goat in 2019, three in 2020, three deer in 2018, two deer in 2019, none in 2020, one elk in 2019, six random and no random this year. And what you could see, it was only showed utilization in one in 2018 and one in 2019. And the mean utilization was less than 5% of the total plants in that. So we also looked at the fecal DNA and found that there were no, okay, um, Pecara castoreus in the fecal DNA um, in any of the samples that we've run from 2018 and 2019. Okay, if we look at, at our long-term monitoring sites, um, we find negligible. So only two plants utilized in 2018, none in, and one in 20, and it was always less than 1% utilization. If we look at Ramulosa, which co-occurs at the sites, but Ramulosa has a, Pecara has a, a smaller distribution and it's it's more narrow because it only is the higher elevations of the Belknap. Draba goes a little lower in elevation as well, but it, it co-occurs with um, Pecara. 
If we look at Draba ramulosa, it was picked up in a few of the feeding sites for goats and deer, and but was never utilized in any of those. And, but this is interesting, our fecal DNA from six mountain goat feeding sites on the Belknap showed a Draba species. And we didn't um, put a voucher in, we put a voucher in for the Castilea, which I'll talk about in a minute, but not for the Drabas. And so we believe it could be Ramulosa because that's the most common one on the Belknap, but we don't know for sure. That's gotta be um, finalized. When we looked at um, utilization of our long-term monitoring sites for Draba Ramulosa, we found that um, Gold Belknap Saddle and Gold Mountain were our two long-term sites. We only found two plants total ever showing utilization. It was less than 1% of the plant utilized. And so this is another thing that maybe that uh, it could be Ramulosa, but um, we'd have to because that 2019, it showed some goats, but we don't, um, we don't know for sure at this point. So what do the camera trap data tell us um, from the Picara castoreus and Draba ramulosa long-term monitoring sites? And these co-occur so the same sites. What does it tell us? So what we found in image captures, these are the non-wind events. These are the actual events that involved something other than wind. At our Gold Mountain site, we found deer, cottontail, coyote, red fox, and humans. Um, percentage of the image captures that were herbivores were 26% roughly, no mountain goats, and humans of the image captures were <laughs> close to 60%. Of our, in our long-term site on um, the Belknap Saddle, we didn't pick up any herbivores. We only picked up humans that like to hike to the top of Belknap, and we got 100% of all of our captures. We didn't get a lot of them, a lot of wind events, but 100% um, of those were humans. Now on our Gold Mountain site, we our data were limited because somebody, a human, put a log up in front of our camera. So we missed a lot of the data. <laughs> so that was a little frustrating. Now, what did the utilization look like on the bell on the bullion volcanics and the other Draba that was endemic to that site? So um, right here we have Draba sobolifera, which is endemic to the bullion volcanics and only northwest facing aspects, right by snowdrifts as they're melting. Um, we found that when it was picked up in centroids, it was never eaten. So if we picked it up at a feeding site, it never showed utilization. Um, it was also never found, we could not find this Draba in any of our fecal DNA samples. Um, our long-term monitoring sites, we show um, if it did show some utilization in 2018, it was negligible, less than 1% of the plant. That could even just be insect damage for, for that level of utilization. Camera trap data for Sobolifera shows that um, at the uh, site on um, the Bullion Volcanics near Copper Belt Trailhead, it had deer, marmot, ground squirrel, red fox, coyotes, and humans. 92% of the captures that we saw in the images were herbivores. Um, zero mountain goats at that site and humans were about 3%. Um, Draba Sobolifera at the higher elevation Poison Creek site, which is in kind of the core use area for mountain goats. We found mountain goat, deer, coyote, fox, and humans. 76% um, of the captures were herbivores and 64% were mountain goats and about 6% humans. So mountain goats are there, but they don't appear to be eating Draba Sobolifera. The um, Ipomopsis um, spicata, as you can see here, long, we, let me just go further, we did not pick it up at any feeding sites in 2018 through 2020. So it wasn't at any ungulate feeding sites or any of our randoms. Um, but what we did find is that at our two long-term monitoring sites, there was utilization, but it was usually just the flower stalks that were taken. And when we look at the camera trap data, which is pretty interesting, we find that 50, the percent of the captures that we see, roughly 53% and 83%, depending on the site, were herbivores. Now, the most interesting find, that, and marmot was one of the big players, but lots of chipmunks and, and golden mantle ground squirrel. The most interesting find that we had is at our South Etna Peak site, I counted 106 marathon runners ran right through my long-term monitoring site for Ipomopsis last summer. 
and the Forest Service wasn't even aware they were supposed to keep all the marathons on trails. There's no trail near the site. They ran right through long-term monitor population, but you should know that this at this site for the Ipomopsis, there's also Castilea parvula, so two rare plants. And if you think there's a 30 second delay, what do you think the odds are that we're missing some of the runners? There's probably more than 106 marathon runners. So let's look at Castilea parvula. What we found with this rare plant is that it does get eaten. As you can see at the centers, 50 of mountain goats, 80, um, 50%, four, these are the numbers of um, feeding sites that had it, and it's eaten 80% of the centroids had utilization. And utilization ranged from 18% to 42% roughly. And you can see it's an elk. We found it in random, but it had a much lower utilization in our random sites. It's within one of the top 10 most utilized plant species within mountain goat and deer feeding sites. So if we look at fecal DNA, we found in two sample elk samples from 2019, we found Castilea parvula um, in one marmot sample that we had, and it had the highest in the marmot. We found 10 deer samples, five in 2018, five 2019. It was found in 18 mountain goat samples, nine in 2018, nine 2019. We also found one cow pie near Delano Peak in the um, um, way up higher than cows are supposed to be. We collected the cow pie. It contained Castilea parvula in the cow pie. So they were feeding on Castilea parvula and also contained weeds like hordium, which is a big worry that they might be bringing weeds up into this pristine alpine communities. Utilization at long-term, what we find is that our long-term sites, um, Castilea parvula is being eaten. So the touch or paintbrush is palatable. But um, when we look at our capture, look at the percentages, the mean utilizations, right? Anywhere from, you know, 30 to 70% right here, 14, 18% uh, in 2020. So it is palatable. And you can see here's one of our tag plants at Mount Holly, and you can see mountain goat fecal sample, right? They're using this rare plant site. But we look at our camera chat data. This is probably one of my favorite photos that I got on my cameras is this little kid. But when we look at those, the species that we picked up, so, and at Mount Holly, 71% of our um, captures were herbivores, s s roughly 70% mountain goat, and 90% of the herbivore captures were mountain goat, and only 4% human. If you go, um, we do see mountain goats and 15% at Poison Creek Ridge, but we don't find mountain goats at Mud Lake or Copper Belt, and we find a high percentage of, of other herbivores. And Golden Mountain Ground Schools was one of them. So it's palatable by everything, including, but it doesn't look like mountain goats are eating all of the Castilea populations, depends on where you are. So we set up some exclosure data and I, this year exclosure, and I have some preliminary stuff, but I'm not going to report on it because, but I think this is going to tell us these are at the Castilea sites. These are going to really get at um, whether or not we have um, impacts on the Castilea as well, but we have two pairs that we've set up where we've got chicken wire that excludes all of the small things and then um, just exclosures to exclude the ungulates. So we can compare what the ungulates are eating versus what um, the small mammals are eating. You've got about one minute. Okay, so my concluding thoughts. <laughs> um, so each of the five rare plant species in the Tushers have conservation threats. There's increasing anthropogenic threats in the area. And you can see off-road vehicles, humans, there's so many hikers that have found this treasure of the Tusher Mountains that are using it. Marathons running through sites. Mountain goats appear to have impacts um, on Castilea parvula in part of its range, but not on all of the rare plants in this area. More research will actually help us provide insight into long-term stability of these rare plant populations. But this is off-road vehicle use right into Castilea habitat. So you're seeing that there's not supposed to be off-road vehicles, but we are seeing damage from that. So there are real threats besides the mountain goats for all of these rare plants. And with that, I just wanna thank, here's the, my two graduate students, my collaborator from the Forest Service and husband, Steve Flinders, and the slew of undergraduates who have helped on this project and the Division of Wildlife Resources and the Forest Service for their funding and support.